National Prayer Breakfast. President Donald Trump addresses an annual gathering in Washington, D.C. He discusses his administration's faith-based efforts and takes a few swipes at rivals. Moving on, both sides of the aisle are reacting after the Senate acquits President Trump in his impeachment trial. Coronavirus and Catholics, as the deadly outbreak continues, how the virus is affecting the faithful in China. And International Religious Freedom Alliance, an inside look at a new initiative from the State Department. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, February 6, 2020. And thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Trump gathered Republicans at the White House today to mark the end of his Senate impeachment trial. He calls it a celebration, but his disdain for Democrats is not ceasing. He even criticized them at this morning's national prayer breakfast. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Tracy, President Trump calls Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi horrible. He says he doubts she even prays at all. His remarks started this morning at the National Prayer Breakfast and continued this afternoon here at the White House. The National Prayer Breakfast quickly got political. Upon his arrival, a triumphant President Trump raised up newspaper headlines announcing his impeachment acquittal. But he's not ready to bury the hatchet. When they impeach you for nothing, uh, then you're supposed to like them. It's not easy, folks. Democratic Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who led the impeachment charge against the president, prayed before he spoke. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pelosi has often said she prays for the president. And yesterday, Senator Mitt Romney, a Mormon, talked about the importance of his faith in office. I take an oath before God as enormously consequential. He then became the lone Republican voting to convict the president on an impeachment charge. President Trump's speech at today's bipartisan prayer breakfast included this. I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. Nor do I like people who say, I pray for you, when they know that that's not so. The president went on to talk about the importance of religious liberty. In America, we celebrate faith. We cherish religion. We lift our voices in prayer. President Trump says he's defending prayer in public schools, persecuted Christians around the world, and the sanctity of life in the womb. Every child is a sacred gift from God. Back at the White House, the president continued to slam the Democratic-led impeachment effort. This was crooked politics. This was crooked politics. And he remained focused on the headlines. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. President Trump apologized to his family that they had to go through the impeachment process. He says he still wants to work with Democrats to build infrastructure and lower drug prices. At the White House, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi criticized the president for making the National Prayer Breakfast political. She made those remarks in her first press conference since Tuesday's State of the Union address, where she ripped up a copy of the president's remarks, and the first since President Trump's impeachment acquittal. Catholic News Agency's Matt Hadro reports now from Capitol Hill. Good evening, Tracy. Speaker Pelosi accuses the president of, quote, talking about things he knows little about, faith and prayer, end quote. And just one day after the conclusion of the impeachment trial, Pelosi also praised one Republican senator for voting to convict the president. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has kind words for Republican Senator Mitt Romney, who voted yesterday to convict President Trump on the first charge of impeachment, abuse of power. The first time in history that a senator has voted against his own president in a, a, a decision regarding uh, impeachment. God bless him for his courage. Romney voted with his party on obstruction of Congress, and the president was ultimately acquitted of both charges. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell dismissed ideas Romney was in the GOP doghouse for his controversial vote and urged Congress to close the book on impeachment. It's time to move on. This decision has been made. As far as I'm concerned, it's in the rearview mirror. And the consequences of it in terms of 
the future are up to the voters of the country to decide who they want uh, to lead the government. His Democratic counterpart, Senator Chuck Schumer, does not plan to make it easy for McConnell and the Republicans to turn the page. It's the most ridiculous argument that elections should decide when the founding fathers put impeachment in the Constitution. Look, you know, this idea we have too many impeachments, too few impeachments, the standard should not be how many or what's politically right or wrong. The standard should be, did the president commit high crimes and misdemeanors? I think it's conclusive that the president did. And if the president does it in three months, they should impeach him again. And if the next president does it, they should impeach him or her. While the impeachment trial has ended, Congressman Adam Schiff, the House's lead impeachment manager, indicates its fallout may be far from over. Schiff tells the Associated Press that no final decisions have been made as to whether or not to subpoena former National Security Advisor John Bolton to testify about the issue at the heart of the impeachment trial, President Trump's dealings with the Ukraine. At the Capitol, Matt Hadro, EWTN News Nightly. Pope Francis meets today with the Prime Minister of Croatia. Andrei Plankovic met with the Holy Father and other Holy See officials. They discussed the challenges facing the future of Europe. They also talked about security, migration, and the situation of the Croatian people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Catholics make up about 86% of Croatia's population. Officials in China say the death toll from the coronavirus has risen to more than 560 people. And the number of those infected globally is more than 28,000, with most of the cases in China and 12 in the U.S. as of today. In the city of Wuhan, where the virus originated, officials have created makeshift hospitals. That development came just as the World Health Organization announced that in the last 24 hours, it has seen the biggest increase in cases since the epidemic began. What's more, a newborn in China has been diagnosed with the coronavirus just 36 hours after the infant was born. And it's now being reported that the doctor who sounded the alarm on the coronavirus in China has died from the illness. A new report says the coronavirus is also impacting Catholic churches. Asia News says churches are canceling masses and other celebrations. Instead, Catholic leaders have asked the faithful to pray on their own or in small groups. They're also offering masses on television. Some faithful in the country have gone more than two weeks without mass. There are an estimated 10 to 12 million Catholics in the communist country. Father Bernardo Civarella, editor-in-chief of Asia News, joins us now from Rome. Father, thank you for joining us. Next year. Father, can you give us an overview of what Chinese Catholics are going through right now? Uh, they are in a very difficult situation because uh, many cities are closed and blocked, uh, locked down, uh, and they cannot go out. They cannot. Uh, nobody can go in. Um, supermarkets sometimes they don't have food and uh, uh, one person every two days for each family can go out to bring some food to the family. So uh, the people, they, they have to stay in the houses. And uh, above all in Hubei province, where there is the epicenter of the, um, of the coronavirus. But also in other cities, the people, they don't move. For example, I have friends in Shanghai or in Guangzhou, and they don't move from home. So they are staying all the time in, uh, at home. And also during Sunday, they have to stay at home because the churches uh, are closed. And uh, because the government uh, advised not to have big gathering uh, of people, so uh, all the masses are canceled. And uh, in this way, people, they are staying at home and pray at home and uh, uh, celebrate the, the, the liturgy of the world, reading Bibles, uh, reciting the rosary, and uh, praying for China that uh, this coronavirus can, uh, um, can finish soon. Do you know when uh, folks will be able to leave their home and go to church and go to Mass? Uh, no, we don't know because uh, up to now the, the closure of the the closure of the of the houses uh, is uh, in a an indefinite time. Uh, so uh, I think they will they will uh, 
give the permission to go out of the, of the houses when the um, epidemic will stop. But uh, uh, scientists, they say that uh, it will last at least until April or May. Mm. Well, Father, did that request uh, indefinitely cancel mass, did that come from church leaders or did that come from the government officials? The government officials, they asked for uh, uh, not having gathering. And uh, different dioceses, I would say, uh, the underground uh, dioceses and uh, official dioceses, they decided not to have masses. And so many bishops, they sign documents to uh, advise people not to go to mass because the church would be closed and to have small gathering, small family gathering uh, in the house. What is very interesting is that uh, the government officials, uh, at least with the new regulation for the religious activities, they forbid uh, religious meeting in, in the families, in the houses. And they forbid to have young people uh, uh, of uh, 18 years or less uh, to join in the religious activities. Instead, in this way, families, they are united and they are praying all together, young people and old. Oh, Father, thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate it. Father Bernardo Cheverella, Editor-in-Chief of Asia News. Thank you again. Thanks to you. A Vatican official is weighing in on when the highly anticipated report on former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick will be made public. Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin says he expects the document to be released in the near future, but the final decision belongs to the Holy Father. McCarrick was a cardinal and archbishop of two major American dioceses before he was found guilty of sexual abuse. In 2018, he resigned from the College of Cardinals and last year was laicized by Pope Francis. Coming up, we examine a new initiative from the State Department to defend religious freedom around the world. The chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Tom Perez, is calling for a re-canvas of the results of the Iowa caucuses, saying it is needed to, quote, assure public confidence after three days of technical issues and delays. With 97 percent of precincts reporting, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders are nearly tied for the lead. Both candidates have declared themselves victorious in the contest. It's unclear if the Iowa State Party plans to follow the directive. Joel Griffith, research fellow at the Heritage Foundation, joins me now by Skype with his analysis. Joel, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Joel, it seems like the problems in Iowa just won't stop. No, we are almost 72 hours now out of those caucuses. We thought we'd have results late that night. I was staying up watching until probably one in the morning. Those results never came in. What's interesting is that with 97% of the votes in, it's apparent that Senator Sanders is almost surely going to win the popular vote from those caucus results. But those 3%, that last 3% is very important because uh, Iowa has what's known as a satellite caucus system that Senator Sanders has invested very heavily in. And uh, it looks as if a lot of those votes will actually be going to favor Senator Sanders. If that holds true, he might walk away not just with the win in the popular vote, but with an outright win um, in the delegates that come out of the state. And that is definitely causing a lot of consternation with some Democratic Party officials. Joel, can you talk about the impact on the candidates, especially Joe Biden, who was thought to be the front runner? Uh, well, uh, Senator Biden, it looks as if uh, he will be finishing fourth place in the Iowa caucus. Um, that's definitely not what uh, the campaign was looking for going into New Hampshire. And uh, as of now, he's polling um, in a distant, I think, uh, third place uh, in New Hampshire. So these results, uh, what we can be sure of, these results were not good for Senator Biden, but uh, these were certainly very strong results for Mayor Pete and for Senator Sanders. Yeah, and the New Hampshire primary is now just days away. How do you think these issues in Iowa are going to impact the candidate's performance in the Granite State, if at all? Uh, I mean, if you look at some of the polling data now uh, that's coming out of New Hampshire, um, Senator Sanders is maintaining uh, his lead, um, and it looks as if Mayor Pete has bumped up several points in the polls. So it's looking like a 
Uh, it's going to be a very fiery race. It's going to be an exciting race to watch in a few days. And I really hope that once they move beyond the politics of this, and I understand it's, it can be entertaining to watch, we need to keep our eye on those issues. And the fact is that uh, a lot, of, a number of leading candidates on the left have proposed spending and that, that amounts to 40 to $90 trillion over 10 years. And there just simply is no way that we can rely on the wealthy to pay for this. This would involve major tax hikes on the middle class and make us look a lot more like Europe. And if you like paying a 50% payroll tax, which is what they're paying in France, well, you're going to have some uh, major tax hikes here to look forward to if that agenda gets implemented. Well, Joe, let's change gears here for a second. The other big political story this week, of course, is impeachment. Your thoughts on where we are now post-acquittal? Well, look, th this impeachment process has been a tremendous waste of national resources, a waste of time, and it's been a big diversion of our attention when we as the public and Congress should have been focused on the issues that actually matter to Americans. This was a, a sham. Um, and this has longer lasting repercussions, possibly, where if you have a Congress that's encroaching on the president's ability to engage in foreign policy, um, this is going to be a shift, could be a shift in power from what the Constitution has given to the executive and could shift that over to Congress because the president may be inclined in the future to get congressional approval for actions which he has authority to take on his own. All right. Well, thank you so much, Joel Griffith, the research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. We appreciate your insight. Thank you. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, the president of Susan B. Anthony List gives pro-life analysis from the Iowa caucus. The grassroots pro-life Democrat is about a third of the base, and they're completely ignored, not allowed a home. And it, it, frankly, it means that pro-life Republicans are going to benefit by those votes. Marjorie Dannis-Velzer joins host Catherine Hadro to discuss the kickoff to the 2020 presidential election. You can see the interview tonight at 10 Eastern on EWTN. Visit EWTN.com for other airing times. Up next, Pope Francis releases his prayer intention for the month of February. Today's National Prayer Breakfast provides an opportunity to take a look at the gains made in protecting religious freedom in this country and the work needed to protect religious freedom around the world. While exact figures are hard to pin down, it is estimated that more than 8 in 10 people in the world today live where they cannot practice their faith freely. Joining me now is Dee Dee Loggenson. She is Executive Director of Save the Persecuted Christians. Dee Dee, welcome. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Tracy. It's good to be here. I know that you were at the breakfast this morning and you also had your own side event. Can you tell us about the breakfast, uh, the feeling there in the room today, and also the event that you hosted? Yes, absolutely. The prayer breakfast every year. This is the 68th annual prayer breakfast, and there are just so many people from all over the world who are there to pray and to get to know one another better. And it was just fabulous. It was especially good to see President Trump uh, on stage this morning after the acquittal yesterday and for him to speak specifically and boldly about the persecution of Christians. We were very encouraged by that. Great. Um, talk about the event that you had. You said you had a side event there today. Yes, yeah, so immediately following the breakfast, our organization, Save the Persecuted Christians, which is a coalition and a grassroots. It's a coalition of nearly 200 civil society, faith, and community leaders who work to raise uh, the information in the United States about the global crisis of Christian persecution, in which 80% of those persecuted for their faith in the world are Christians. So our organization hosted a panel event with Congressman Frank Wolf. Uh, Bob Fu of China Aid, uh, and uh, Secretary Tristan Azbe from Hungary's uh, Secretariat to Aid to the Persecuted Christians. It was really a fabulous event, and so many people showed up that we had people standing out in the hallway. Wow. Well, yesterday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the launch of the International Religious Freedom Alliance. How important do you think that is to have this sort of you know, global cooperation and bringing an end to religious persecution? Yes, well, this administration has done more to protect and defend religious liberty both at home and abroad than any other administration previously. 
This alliance is the fruit of the U.S. ministerials, which have been hosted now for two years. This alliance uh, is a coalition of countries. I'm told now 26 countries have joined on, and the United States is truly leading the way to uh, defend the right, the human right, of people to express themselves and to worship freely. Didi, can we talk about the role that religion plays in securing peace and stability? Religion is the foundation of a free society. Societies that cherish and uphold the human right to freedom of religion or belief, these societies flourish. Their economies are better, the people are happier, it's good for families, it's just good across the board. Yeah. Didi, quickly, uh, can you talk about uh, some of the maybe look at the religious persecution of Christians around the world and, and what do you think, which country or countries concerns you the most? Yes, we are very, very concerned about what we see as a genocide that is not, uh, not addressed or recognized by the international community in Nigeria. And uh, the, all of the Sahel is being affected by uh, terrorists uh, who are um, mercilessly on a daily basis slaughtering Christians. So we are very concerned about uh, West Africa and what is happening there. You see that the Islamic State has found a new home in these vast ungoverned territories. So Burkina Faso and Mali and Chad and Nigeria are all being hit very hard. And I really do hope that Americans will plug in and, and come behind them like we did in, in the Sudan, uh, we are pushing for the appointment of a U.S. special envoy to Nigeria and the Lake Chad region. We're also very concerned about what's happening in China and with the new enforcement of the religious uh, restrictions that have gone into place just this month. Uh, the house churches are terribly oppressed. Well, Didi, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your knowledge and your insight with us. Thank you for having me. That's Dee Dee Langison, Executive Director of Save the Persecuted Christians. Again, thank you, Dee Dee. Thank you. Well, finally tonight, Pope Francis releases his prayer of intention for the month of February. He asked the entire world to hear and pay attention to the cries of migrants. A menudo, los migrantes son víctimas del tráfico y de la trata de personas. The Holy Father says human trafficking happens because of corruption, and he calls the financial gains from trafficking blood money. It has become the custom for Pope Francis to release a video message detailing his prayer intention for each month. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.